When applying quantum mechanics to polyatomic molecules, what one generally finds is that uh, the better your basis set uh, represents the eigenstates of the polyatomic molecule, the more accurate results will be. All right, and it, that's an easy thing to say, but sometimes a difficult thing to achieve. Now, one of the things that uh, can be most difficult in this is that sometimes we need those uh, basis functions to be a little flexible. That is to say, we can't just stamp the same p orbital on every atom and expect to get a good result out of that. Sometimes we want those p orbitals to do different things when they get to there. So for example, what if I had a molecule like acetylene? And uh, just to remind you, uh, remind me too, acetylene looks something like this. All right, it's a pair of carbons, it's a linear molecule, and, and on each carbon there are p orbitals. And uh, what I want to do is focus in on this, I'll just say this left carbon here. And we're going to have a couple of p orbitals. Now, the first one I want to draw, though, is the p orbital that's aligned along the bond. So let's say this would be the pz orbital. And let me color that uh, red just to emphasize it. Okay, so this pz orbital is, is going to have a very special purpose. And because it's aligned along the bond, it's going to have different sort of spatial needs than say the other two p orbitals. So if I were to draw the other two p orbitals, you know, I may have, uh, so this is the z p orbital. I may have a y p orbital that's up here and down here. And then I would have an x p orbital that's sticking out front and back behind. And th that's a little bit easier, a lot of, little bit more difficult to draw here in a two-dimensional uh, drawing. But I hope you get the idea the x orbital is sticking out the y p orbital is sticking up and the z p orbital is left and right. All right, so these three p orbitals uh, are going to have different needs. That is to say, different needs in terms of accurately representing the wave function of acetylene. So how would I be able to program that in? Um, how would I be able to set up my basis so that it could adjust itself for the p orbitals on these carbons in such a way that it'll take account of that? Well, ideally what I want to do is I want to create a basis function. And I'll just say this is a, a basis function for the 2p orbitals. And I'll use STO to indicate this is a Slater type orbital. But what I, uh, what I really want to do is set this up so that it is the sum of two Slater type orbitals, um, one of which I'll denote as being a function of r and one zeta parameter, and a second of which will be a function of r with a second zeta parameter. All right, so now what do I gain by having a linear combination like this? Well, you'll recall that when we talked about the Slater orbitals and how they look, uh, you know, without the r to the n minus 1 part, but the exponential decay part, um, they had a fast decay if r was large and a slower decay if r was small. So this is large r, I'm sorry, large zeta. <laughs> this is small zeta. So here's the whole idea behind creating a function like this. If I have uh, large zeta here, as zeta 1 and small zeta as zeta 2. What I want is I want to tune these expansion coefficients in such a way that on some of the carbons uh, the z orbital would have a, a compact, that is a, a zeta 1 sort of um, pz uh, p orbital, whereas the x and y's are going to be more diffuse. They're hanging out here, they're spreading out, um, they're not focused by the presence of another nucleus uh, along, their, uh, along their axis. So they end up getting spread out somewhat more. So they need a different sort of radial, fu radial function, radial part. So in other words, I would want this cofactor to be emphasized with the 2pz, and I'd want this cofactor to be emphasized with the 2px and 2py. All right, well, so it turns out that I can set up this linear combination of Slater type orbitals uh, so that uh, we can accomplish this. Um, so it, it adds a small layer of complication to the calculation because now my orbitals are these linear combinations. But in fact, by adjusting these coefficients, 
I can now use the same form, the same functional form for my basis functions for all the carbons, whether they have this need or not. Maybe there's another carbon that's got a methyl group, in which case I want all the p orbitals to be equally weighted. So in other words, they would all have the same zeta uh, parameter uh, affecting them the same radial extent. All right, now I'll remind you that each of these Slater type orbitals, each of these is composed of Gaussians. All right, so that we can calculate all of the necessary integrals and so forth more easily. But it turns out that uh, we can use different numbers of Gaussians for the parts that are narrowly held to the nucleus versus the ones that are diffuse. Now you may remember too that uh, where the Gaussians do the best job is they really fit really well out here. And so I could basically use one Gaussian to fit something that's very diffuse, and I should say this curve out here. One Gaussian might be good enough because this is the important part for that curve. But for a Gaussian, uh, for a Slater type orbital that's very close to the nucleus, here's one where I may need to use multiple Gaussians. So I may to use, to need to use many Gaussians to fit this part of that basis function. All right, so let me summarize what I'm saying here. I've got two different Slater type orbitals, one of which is narrow and one of which is broad. The narrow one, for zeta 1, the narrow one is going to require many Gaussians to model it. The broader one doesn't require as many Gaussians to model it, so um, that th these can be modeled a little bit more easily. So what I have basically created here is something we call a split valence. Okay, so a split valence basis set. Now there's another refinement of this that I also want to be sure to mention, and that is the following. That core orbitals tend to be pulled closer to the nucleus. So core orbitals tend to require more Gaussians. Alright, but since they are not really participating in the bonding very much, we can treat them all as though they're pretty much the same no matter what the environment around the particular atom, the carbon atom in this case, might be. So in fact, we're only going to have one variety of the core orbitals. So basically these core orbitals are going to be represented by a single Slater type orbital, but this single Slater type orbital may have many Gaussians to express its radial portion simply because we need those in order to get an accurate read on that part of the that part of the wave function. The valence orbitals are the ones where we will use the split valence or the split basis set which will have a, uh, a I'll call it a tight Slater type orbital so large zeta 1 and a loose Slater type orbital, which I'll call with the smaller zeta 2. And this one will need some more Gaussians than the, than the looser type, but probably not as many as the core orbitals. So in other words, we have three layers of Gaussian representations for these three types of Slater type orbitals. As a result, when we write down the designations for these kinds of orbital sets, uh, we actually tend to have a format that looks something like this, N-M-P-G. G, as always, stands for Gaussian. Whenever you see Gal G in these things, usually that's what it means. The N is going to tell me how many Gaussians are in these core orbitals. The M is going to tell me how many Gaussians are used for the tight one of the two uh, split valence orbitals. And the P will tell me how many are used for the loose. I will tell you that the P oftentimes is equal to 1, almost always equal to 1. So what might a typical uh, basis set like this type uh, be, be labeled? Well, for example, the 3-2-1-G basis 
is one that you might encounter. It's actually not a very sophisticated basis, and, and uh, it gives moderately good results, but uh, not the best results. Um, but what this means is that all the core orbitals, all the core Slater-type orbitals, will have three Gaussians to represent them. When we get to the split valence part, well, this dash here tells us that it is a split valence orbital, okay, if it has the dash. The two tells me that the tight the tighter one of the two types of uh, orbitals, the one with the larger zeta value, um, will be represented by two Gaussians. And the loose or smaller zeta orbital, Slater type orbital, will be represented by a single Gaussian. All right, so this way we get a lot of information from this label. It tells us exactly what's going into the composition of the basis sets that we use. Now, I'll, I'll mention parenthetically, or maybe not parenthetically because I'm saying it, um, that this particular basis where I'm using six Gaussians for the core orbitals, three for the tight form of the valence orbitals, and one for the loose form of the valence orbitals, this is a particularly well-used uh, basis set. It's um, proven to be very reliable for, in a number of different circumstances, and enables one to um, and enables one to uh, get fairly good results uh, in a fairly efficient manner. But uh, the whole idea here basically is that when you see a basis set designated, and it happens to be a split valence basis set, hopefully now you have an opportunity to understand what the various numbers and parts of that label mean, uh, so you'll know what you're buying into. Obviously, the bigger these numbers are, the more accurate your results are likely to be. However, the more time-consuming the calculation will be. So it's always a balance between accuracy and efficiency.